Are you ready, kids? Hey guys, Pie Rules here, and welcome to every episode of SpongeBob Season 9A Reviewed. Yes, I am reviewing Season 9A in this video. What is Season 9A? Well, it's a fan term for the first 20 episodes of SpongeBob Season 9. These 20 episodes were aired and made before the second SpongeBob movie came out, whereas the rest of Season 9 was aired after the movie and presumed to have been finished after the movie was finished. With the minor exception of Yeti Crabs, which aired after the second movie, but we know was made before it. And that would make 9B the last 29 episodes of Season 9. Fans like to split this up because, Yeti Crabs excluded, there was a pretty long gap between 9A and 9B. Some fans also think that 9B is really good compared to 9A, which they consider just average. That's not necessarily my opinion, I'm just explaining that that's why a lot of people like to split it up. But that's not why this video is in two parts. It's in two parts because I feel Feel like it's getting to be too many episodes for me to review all in one video. There are 49 episodes in this season, and I want to make sure I get to say everything I want about each and every episode, so splitting the video in two means that I just have more time to talk about each episode without the video going on for a ridiculous four, five, or six hours. Putting it in two parts means that I can also make a video about the second Spongebob movie in between the review of 9A and 9B. And also, if I didn't split it up, you would not be seeing another season review this this soon because technically speaking at the time of me making this there is still one season 9 episode that has remained unaired. Season 9 is interesting for a lot of reasons. Firstly, it took so long to air. To put it into perspective, season 9 was the current season when I started doing these reviews. It started airing in 2012 and as of the time of this video, very very late 2016, still has not finished airing. The main reason for this seems to be be the second Spongebob movie. Because they basically halted production, Nickelodeon only had the episodes in 9A to air, so they decided to hold them and stretch it out over long periods of time so that we wouldn't be completely without Spongebob. And as much as it is frustrating for fans to have to go so long between them, I will give Nick credit for making sure there was at least one new episode every year. The other thing I wanted to mention before getting into the reviews is the fact that the show changed from standard definition to widescreen HD. This was not the first time Spongebob was ever in HD though. There were two episodes, Truth or Square and It's a Spongebob Christmas, from previous seasons that were broadcast in HD. But this is the first entire season to be in HD. Of course, I will talk about this in detail as it comes up, but I want to give an overview of this now because this is a huge format change for the show. Sure, Spongebob went from more traditional inking in season one to the digital stuff we all know and love now in season two and has gone through a few slight art evolutions over the seasons but none have ever been as drastic as this big switch to HD. And it's something you notice right away when watching the season. SpongeBob took its sweet time transitioning into high definition, and I can't blame the people behind the show. The thing is, when you switch to HD, you have to change certain things. For instance, they had to redo the bubble transition because obviously it just wouldn't fit the screen. Another thing that they had to redo was the theme song, although it took them a while on that. The episodes aired in 9A did not have the HD theme song, on initial airing. And in fact, if you bought the episodes on Amazon Instant Video and I assume other places, they will also have the old style opening. My point is, it's not as simple to just say, all right, well, now we're going to do this in a little bit higher definition. Certain things had to change and be redone, which is a pretty big deal for a show like SpongeBob that intentionally tries to change as little as possible in the almost 18 years it's been on air. I'll talk about the new HD opening in the season 9B video but there are some changes that I want to talk about here. Like I mentioned, the bubble transition looks different, and I have to say that I really like it. It looks really clear and nice. Another noticeable change is that places like the Krusty Krab or SpongeBob's house just have a much bigger feel to them because more of them can fit in the frame at any given time. And although it takes a little bit of getting used to, it does look really good. And since they switched to HD, I've noticed they've done quite a few wide shots, shots from far away that show a 
lot of the background and have the characters be relatively small. You notice it right away in the first episode of the season, which has to do with extreme sports. Now that the definition is higher and they have more screen space, there's just a lot more area to work with. And this is especially noticeable in scenes with Plankton. Now more than ever, they can do a great job of showing how much smaller he is than the other characters. Overall, I am very happy with what they have done with this new format change. I hope you enjoyed this little bit of analysis before I get to reviewing the episodes. Splitting the video up means I have more time to talk about stuff like this. And I figured I'd just get the whole HD thing out of the way up front instead of having to wait till the end of the video. One more thing I have to mention before I get to my usual spiel is that whenever there is a big change to a show, either visually or something behind the scenes like the creator coming back, there are going to be people who automatically claim that the show is better or good again. It's easy to be suckered in by new episodes after a long time without and a shiny new HD style and artificially bump up ratings of these episodes without giving them the same treatment as all the rest. While yes, the HD is nice, it's important to realize that this is a thing that can happen and not to let your actual judgment get swept away in hype. There are a lot of people out there that think season 9 is the second coming of Spongebob. And while I'm sure some people have judged it fairly and do genuinely believe that, it's likely that some aren't judging these episodes fairly. Which is fine if you're just a casual viewer, but if you want to look at things critically, you do have to give every episode a fair and equal shot. And now my usual spiel before we begin. First of all, I have a series called Spongy Bits, which is a singular review or a series of reviews of SpongeBob episodes that I've already covered in season reviews, but I go into a bit more depth there. If you like these videos, you'll probably like those videos, so check them out. Secondly, I have a series of videos called Square Theory, wherein I talk about various topics related to SpongeBob. If you hear me saying something repeatedly in these videos, then odds are I've probably made a Square Theory about it. If you wanna hear more on topics like what makes a Squidward torture episode bad, or why Patrick is such a jerk, then please check out this series of videos. Also, I will be spoiling everything in these episodes, so if you haven't seen some of these season 9A episodes, then you might not want to watch this video yet. Before making this video, the only episodes of season 9A I'd seen were Kenny the Cat and Little Yellow Book, and I'd seen both of those around the time they were both aired, meaning it's been a long time. And one last important note is that at this moment, I have seen every episode of season 9B as well. Even though I split the season 9 video into 9A and 9B, I still wanted to make sure I'd at least seen every episode in the season. I've only seen 9B once, so I have not seen these episodes enough to form a solid opinion, just enough to really get a taste and to just kind of know what's coming up. And with all that out of the way, let's start off with the first episode of my long-awaited review of SpongeBob Season 9. Episode 179A, Extreme Spots. SpongeBob and Patrick try to prove they are extreme to an extreme sports group. First of all, this episode is a really great way to show off the new animation. There is a lot of action going on here, a lot of different camera angles, a lot of wide shots, a lot of explosions, just a lot going on, and it does a really good job of showing off what they can do now. If nothing else, it's a very good looking episode. Additionally, I like the new characters they got. Johnny Knoxville does a great job as Johnny Krill, and the other two characters are so outrageously extreme they just stick in your head. Not Dead Ted, the crazy one, and Grand Mall Granny, as the elderly person who also participates in extreme sports. So the visuals and the characters are good, but that's about where the good things end. Unfortunately, there isn't really much of a story here. It's one of those episodes that's just about Spongebob and Patrick trying to prove that they aren't little babies. And that's as far as the story goes. There's not really any ups or downs or twists or turns, it's just Spongebob and Patrick trying to to prove they're tough to these extreme sports stars. And that would be fine if the episode was funny, but the humor here is, well, it's mixed. There are jokes that I like, like the fact that there's just this inexplicably placed random accent guy, and the names of the extreme sports characters are pretty funny too, but at the same time, there's some humor in this that I find quite dumb. The whole pillow and mattress coming to life and swearing vengeance, yeah, that just felt really out of place to me. Similarly, Patrick licking his brain like an ice cream cone 
tone did nothing for me. I will give them credit that they are trying and that there is a number of gags in the episode, but I didn't find that many of them to be funny. Especially the joke that makes the title of the episode. While I like the guy with the weird accent, the whole running thing about Patrick thinking that they need spots to be extreme sports stars and he stings himself with jellyfish and they say, hey, we have extreme spots now. It's a lame pun to begin with, but they just keep going on and on with the gag. Yeah, I thought that was pretty dumb. And the other problem with this episode is that we've had episodes about extreme sports before, pre-hibernation week and a life in a day. This plot is actually very similar to a life in a day. SpongeBob and Patrick trying to prove that they're tough enough to do these extreme stunts. I'm not saying the show could never do another episode about extreme sports, but the fact that there is very little story here and it's a concept that they've done not once but twice before just makes it feel very bland. And if they're going to cover a topic they've already covered before, I'd at least like them to take it in a new direction. Or heck, just be really funny about it. But because it's similar to other stories the show has already done before, as well as the relative blandness of the story, along with the mixed quality humor, but really nice looking visuals and entertaining and memorable new characters, I say that this rounds out to about a Meh. Unfortunately, it takes a little more than just pretty visuals and some fun new characters for me to give it a good. Thanks to the very simple story, the episode feels like it drags, and when I think back to it, although I can remember the characters and the nice visuals, I can't really remember anything else about the episode. Episode 179B, Squirrel Record. Sandy attempts to break every record in the book, with no regard for SpongeBob's safety. So this episode brought back Sandy's robot army from the episode House Sittin' for Sandy. It's always interesting to see what elements on Spongebob actually make return appearances. As most characters, hobbies, and other elements added to the show are usually just one-offs, with the rare exception. I for one welcome the idea of Sandy having a robot army. Think of the stories they could tell. Maybe Karen would leave Plankton and run away with one of them. Maybe they could malfunction and try to take over Bikini Bottom. Maybe they throw a never-ending stream of pies at Patrick's face. The possibilities are endless. Anyway, back to the actual focus of the episode. Story Story-wise, this is very similar to Pre-Hibernation Week. So yeah, that'd be two for two episodes thus far that remind me of Pre-Hibernation Week. But it's true, Sandy wants to do something with SpongeBob, but that something continuously gets SpongeBob hurt until SpongeBob has to do something about it. And like the episode previous, that's about the entirety of the story. It's basically just an extended montage of Sandy breaking records and SpongeBob getting hurt along the way. And while Sandy does break these records in very unusual ways, the episode kind of feels a little bit boring because, much like the previous one, it just doesn't really go anywhere. Sandy succeeds at everything she does. So, outside of the one record that she looks like she might actually fail, the chum one, there's never any suspense or surprise. Well, okay, there's a surprise at the end, where it turns out that everything Sandy did was completely pointless. I wonder how many times Spongebob has done this, had an episode where the ending proves that the events in the episode were utterly, utterly pointless. In this case, it's fun. Fine, it's just a silly comedy ending, but still, it's kind of interesting to think about how Spongebob has done this a number of times. Anyway, my point is, while it's kind of fun to watch Sandy break these records, it's just not all that interesting. One of the more intriguing parts of the story is that, at the very beginning, Spongebob takes a Krabby Patty and puts it in his wallet for later, and then around the middle of the episode he takes it out to resuscitate Sandy after she passes out from eating a bunch of chum. While it was cool that they set up something very early in the episode, episode that paid off a little bit later, it is a bit weird that this wasn't at the climax of the episode. It just happens about midway in. In fact, the chum record was probably the most interesting one. Plankton got a cameo, and it was the one record she looked like she might not actually break, and did genuinely need Spongebob's help for. I just kinda wish that the whole episode could have been like that. Add in some suspense, give Spongebob a real reason to be there. As it stands, this is another episode that I think is meh. It's just kind of boring. And though Sandy's actions are amusing, I wouldn't say that anything in the episode is particularly funny. It's just a pretty middle of the road episode. Though I have to say, I really do enjoy what they did with the name of the record book. How it's a mixture of the Guinness Book of World Records and Ripley's Believe It or Not. Episode 180A, Patrick Man. Patrick decides to become a superhero. In what is the closest thing to this season's version of a Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy episode. Yes, this is Ernest Board 9's last appearance as Mermaid Man, and as such, there is no actual Mermaid Man episode this season. But it is pretty poetic that his last line on the show ever was, EVIL!
So this episode has Patrick donning superhero attire, running around, reprimanding people for crimes that Patrick believes they've committed, even though of course they're all just innocent people doing normal things. This is not a new concept for Spongebob. They've done this before in shuffleboarding and way back in season one's Hall Monitor. In this type of story, you're either going to find Patrick's antics to be really funny or really stupid. Personally, I don't find Patrick's behavior to be funny here and just strong strikes me as annoyingly stupid. And that, combined with the fact that they've done this story before, is not a good combo. However, I do like the climax of this episode. Once an actual supervillain arrives, and Patrick tries to save the day but fails miserably at first, that part I think is actually pretty funny. There were good gags, it was action-packed, and it made for a pretty exciting climax. But I don't think that saves this episode from being a Scumbob episode. As cool as the climax is, it's only about two minutes of the episode, and the rest of it is just kind of dumb. Patrick's actions here are obnoxious, instead of being funny and charming like Spongebob's were way back in Hall Monitor. Also, this episode's beginning is weirdly similar to No Hat for Pat, with Patrick talking about Spongebob's hat and how he gets to go have a fun job, which really just makes me wish I was watching that episode. Episode 180B. Gary's new toy. Gary becomes obsessed with a red ball. Oh boy, a Gary episode. Well, if you watched my reviews previously, you probably know that this isn't gonna get a good. And sure enough, it suffers from some of the problems that other Gary episodes have. The biggest problem being just that this feels like every other Gary episode. There's an element of miscommunication with Gary not being able to understand Spongebob's goodbye. Gary obsesses over something just like he did in Treats. Gary leaves Spongebob for another character. Character, like in Dumped. SpongeBob tries to get Gary to do something, like in Gary Takes a Bath. Also, Gary only interacts with Spongebob in the episode. And because Gary can't talk, certain elements of the story are left to be a bit vague. Like, what exactly is this ball? Does it actually have powers? Is it evil? Is it trying to control Gary? Or is this all just made up in his imagination? But, to its credit, the episode isn't annoying and it doesn't really have many bad elements. It's just really samey. And a little too vague on certain points. As far as the humor goes, it's... All right. Patrick's brain getting shot out by the laser was definitely more gross and weird than funny. But I thought it was funny how SpongeBob called Gary creepy for making himself look like the ball, as well as how Gary gets rid of SpongeBob by slapping his eye against the garage door opener. And SpongeBob's eyes getting knocked out of his head was a decent gag as well. Another thing I thought was pretty funny was Plankton's random ad on the bench. It has really nothing to do with anything, but just the way that Plankton is lying down and how just out of left field the bench is, is actually pretty funny. Also, his phone number is apparently 1-800-EAT-CHUM. The episode is about a meh. It's pretty easy to watch, but it's not something I got much enjoyment out of. Maybe someday they can finally break away from having Gary plots that are incredibly similar to previous Gary plots. But unfortunately, this is not that day. Episode 181A, License to Milkshake. SpongeBob must go back to basic training camp to renew his milkshake license. So, if you didn't know, this episode is a big reference to Top Gun. I've never actually seen Top Gun, but that still was pretty apparent to me. And the episode does work as a story on its own in-universe. We aren't talking about one of these parodies where the characters are suddenly just completely out of character for the sake of the parody. And for what it's worth, I think the best part of the episode is the 80s montage, which is a very direct reference to Top Gun. It's fun, upbeat, and fast-paced. Another nice thing about the episode was the climax at the end. I liked that they gave Captain Frosty Mug a weird backstory and how the show suddenly turned up the drama. But on the flip side of things, the entire story was about Spongebob trying to get a license. And while yes, it is very different than a typical boating school episode in a lot of ways, it is still kind of sad that they still had to resort to a similar plot device. Though Spongebob does at least reference at the end that he wishes boating school licenses were as easy to obtain as the milkshake one. Michael McKean plays Captain Frosty Mug, and his character is okay. I wouldn't say he's a very memorable character, but he's not a bad one either. At first, I thought he was going to be a nasty drill sergeant like we've already seen twice on the show, but luckily they took it in a little bit different direction. One thing I didn't like about this story was that it never explains why Spongebob's milkshakes always come out solid. It would have been nice at the end if there was some sort of reveal where it turned out he was putting too much ice in the shakes, or he was using too much syrup, or something else, maybe even something weird and 
comedic, just to explain why he has this specific problem. Yes, they do have the whole milkshakes come from within line, but still, it would have been nice to have an actual reason for Spongebob's shakes turning out this way. And also, I don't really understand the point of a milkshake license. Like, okay, it's silly to begin with, but Spongebob serves the guy a milkshake at the end of the episode before he gets his license back. So, is he still allowed to serve milkshakes without the license? Is it just a prestige thing? Is it like a system of honor where only the best restaurants have licensed milkshake people, but everyone else can still serve milkshakes? I know I'm thinking way too much about this, but I think it's a result of this being another story that's really just bare bones. I know it's Spongebob, so I'm not expecting too much, but I would have liked the story to at least have gone into a little bit more detail, because the comedy in this episode really didn't do anything for me. Yes, Spongebob failing at making milkshakes and a lot of the weirdness of the milkshake camp was amusing, but I wouldn't say that any of it was funny. Overall, I can see some good ideas here with the whole Milkshake Academy, and the montage and the climax were nice, but the episode just wasn't very funny, and I feel it just didn't push its concept concept far enough. This one was close to being good, but I think it is meh. As it stands now, it's a cool novelty that I don't regret watching once, but don't really care about watching again. One interesting note though is that Spongebob's milkshake license first appeared in the episode Yours, Mine, and Mine, so that episode was probably somewhat of an inspiration for the writers to come up with this one. Pretty cool to see a one-off gag inspire a whole episode. Episode 181B Squid Baby. Squidward suffers from a head injury and reverts back to being an infant. If it's one thing the show has taught me, it's that head injuries are always context sensitive. Sometimes you might hit your head and become handsome, other times you might hit your head and become a baby. It really just kind of depends on what's going on in the episode. But jokes aside, this is not a very good episode. First of all, I have to point out that it is similar to Rockabye Bivalve. We've already had an episode with Spongebob and Patrick taking care of a kid, and that one was actually funny. It's kind of getting ridiculous that almost every episode this season thus far feels heavily similar to another episode. But hey, that's just what happens when your show goes on for nine seasons. The show kind of calls attention to this as well when Patrick is watching TV and ignoring the baby. The sounds coming from the TV are the same sounds that came from the TV he was watching in Rockabye Bivalve. If this episode was any good, that might be intentionally calling back to a similar episode, but because this episode stinks, it just serves to remind me of something that I should be watching instead. So, so why does this episode stink like Squidward's dirty diaper? Well, here's the thing. It contains a little bit of everything in terms of things that I don't like about Spongebob episodes. It's got really infantile humor, especially at the beginning with Spongebob and Patrick acting like babies. I mean, they've done many childlike and weird things before, but straight up acting like babies out in public? Yeah, that's really weird, even for these two. The episode also features excessive crying with Squidward, and it's similar to another episode, Rockabye Bivalve. It's got a bit of squid torture in there too, and they top it all off with toilet humor. Now here's the thing, each one of these things in the episode isn't too bad on its own. The excessive crying is relatively understandable, and even though it is pretty similar to Rockabye Bivalve, it's not a direct copy of the episode, it does take it to a slightly different place. The squid torture here isn't too bad, as at least Spongebob and Patrick are trying to keep Squidward safe, and they do seem horrified when they get him accidentally hurt, and the toilet humor is mostly just isolated to one joke about a poopy diaper, although that one joke goes on for a while, and man, do they make it clear that that is a very full diaper. My point is just that none of these things are too bad on their own, but altogether makes for a pretty bad episode. And it's not funny. I could see the episode trying to make jokes, but a lot of it is just really awkward considering it's, you know, adult Squidward in a baby diaper. I feel like this sort of concept was a lot less weird and creepy in Goo Goo Gas. Yeah, it's a Stumbomb episode. It's certainly not unwatchably bad, but it's definitely bad. Though I must admit that there are at least little glimpses of good ideas is here and there. There are moments in the episode where Squidward is kind of cute, and I do like that the problem was solved with the ice machine. Typically this sort of thing is just solved with more blunt trauma to the head, but instead of going down that route, they went with something that does make somewhat logical sense, although in an obvious cartoony way. In that ice usually brings down swelling. Oh, and if you're curious as to what that little purple leg down there means, I wouldn't blame you because it's been a while, but hey, the my leg gag is back, sort of. A character runs away saying, my face, my face, also my leg, but mostly my face.
and he's voiced by Mr. Lawrence. Even though it's not a direct use of that one particular My Leg clip, that is pretty clearly a reference to the My Leg gag. Which is pretty cool, I just wish it had been done in a better episode. Episode 182A, Little Yellow Book. Squidward reads Spongebob's diary. So, believe it or not, this episode has a great significance to the every episode of Spongebob Reviewed series. By around March of 2013, I had done a number of Spongebob reviews of individual episodes and had concluded that all of the newer episodes of the show were just not good. After doing this, though, I decided that was pretty unfair of me to generalize a bunch of seasons of the show like that. So I wanted to check out one of the latest episodes. And wouldn't you know it, Little Yellow Book was on Hulu. And this was the last episode of Spongebob I watched before embarking on this journey to review every episode. Yes. I thought this episode was actually pretty bad, but it did make me want to know what had happened to Spongebob, how we got from season 3 and 4 all the way up to this. And a few months later, I premiered the every episode of Spongebob season 1 reviewed video. But enough about me, let me talk about the episode. So the first thing I'm going to point out is that there actually were jokes in this episode that I liked. The I had a brother once joke, the stealing a hairpin from Mr. Krabs and his hair going all poofy, the old guy that fell in the toilet. I liked all three of those gags, but those were definitely not funny enough to save what is a Scumbob episode otherwise. There's a few things I don't like here, but I'm going to start with Spongebob's weird secrets. Why does Spongebob turn into a chicken when he sees plaid, and why does he get naked when he hears the Bikini Bottom National Anthem? What is the reason for these things? I mean, I know, sure, Spongebob wacky, weird, whatever, but they made him pretty dang weird in this episode. It didn't make me laugh, it just kind of makes me think that there's something seriously wrong with Spongebob. Then there's the whole civilians of Bikini Bottom thing. So, when Squidward is making fun of Spongebob and reading his diary, all of the civilians of Bikini Bottom were laughing right along with him. And Spongebob even comes out at one point, and Squidward shows off the weird things he can make Spongebob do, knowing what he knows from the diary. So the Bikini Bottomites clearly see Spongebob and know it's him, but yet somehow they act surprised that it's Spongebob later. And, throughout the rest of the episode, they throw a giant hissy fit that Squidward read Spongebob's diary. Now look, I get that this is supposed to be ironic. It's supposed to be like, haha, they're singling out Squidward, even though they're just as guilty. But it's just way too much here. They don't do it in a funny way, they just do it in a really nasty and hypocritical way. Especially Patrick. And yes, Squidward does call Patrick out on this, but that's about all the punishment that Patrick's gonna get. And Patrick is supposedly Spongebob's best friend. I don't like these elements, but really what I think makes this story fail is that it goes exactly nowhere. Squidward reads the diary and embarrasses Spongebob, but then after that, all it is is Squidward just repeatedly being yelled at by Bikini Bottomites, inexplicably losing his house, and being put in stockades because he dared read a diary. I don't really have a problem with Squidward being punished for doing a bad thing, and I also don't have a problem with the show treating diary reading as if it's some serious crime, but what I do have a problem with is that that is what the rest of the episode is. Squidward doesn't change or learn, no one tries to read Squidward's diary, there's no interesting turn here, it's just people being down on Squidward. Yes, he deserves it, but no, this doesn't make a good story. And even when you think he might change his ways, of course, he doesn't, because they gotta go with the stupid comedy ending of her dur, he's still reading diaries. It's also one of those things where it feels like this episode would be a lot more interesting if it were actual characters calling out Squidward, not just random background fish. Like, if Sandy was there and continuously harped on Squidward and made him feel guilty, or tried to get revenge for Spongebob by reading his diary. Or if Mr. Krabs had gone a little bit further, he does try to make Squidward feel bad, but then after that he disappears from the episode. If you compare it to something like Fools in April, Squidward feels bad and tries to apologize, and the conflict of the episode is that Squidward has a hard time apologizing to Spongebob. There's a conflict there, there's something actually happening. Here, nothing of the sort happens. Squidward half-heartedly tries to apologize for all of half of a second, but it doesn't even stick. And Spongebob's whole, oh, well, I published the book, and everyone seemed to like it, and everything is good now, is so fake feeling. With how upset he was earlier, it just means that Spongebob takes a random left turn just for an even bigger take that at Squidward. I'm not upset because Squidward got punished for his actions. The story bothers me because it goes nowhere, and it just spends a very long time calling out Squidward. It's just a really negative episode. The first part is spent making fun of Spongebob, and the second part is putting Squidward down. There were a few jokes I laughed at, but nothing that redeems the rest of the episode. Oh, and by the way, Spongebob previously had a diary in Boating
boarding school and gone. 182B. Bumper to bumper. Mrs. Puff takes Spongebob to an abandoned road to teach him how to drive. So right off the bat, one of the things I like about this episode is that Mrs. Puff actually tries to teach Spongebob. And acknowledges that it's his own anxieties that's preventing him from being able to drive. So while it's a bit of an unusual plan, taking him out to just an abandoned highway in the middle of nowhere is actually a good idea. And although, yes, she definitely wants to get rid of Spongebob, she's not anywhere near as harsh as she was the last time she was featured. It does feel like they put put her back in the place of being a teacher who's just frustrated with having a student who is unteachable. Which, by the way, Spongebob was also declared unteachable way back in Mrs. Puff, You're Fired. On the side of comedy for this episode, it is relatively light. There are gags there that I like, like the cop's sunglasses and mustache coming down from his helmet, as well as some of the gags about the runaway boatmobile, both in the beginning of the episode and towards the end of the episode, but it's certainly not a joke-heavy episode. There are also two elements that felt like they went on for a bit too long. First of all, there's the whole Beavis and Buttfish section, which felt relatively out of place, like it should have been something that was just kind of a one-off gag, and not something that should have continued throughout the whole scene. And additionally, Spongebob's little hypnotized freakout sequence went just a little bit too long for my taste. But, the story is good, especially the climax of the episode. I think it is a really action-packed and fun one, especially in HD. Being able to show a 10-lane highway all across the wide screen really looks cool. And, by the way, I love that the show still uses traditional animation on their cars instead of using CG like a lot of shows these days. In fact, a lot of the aesthetics of the episode look really nice, like the desert area or the parts of SpongeBob's freakout sequence. It is another episode that I think really utilizes the HD well. And the episode has a good energy to it because a lot of it is spent inside of a boatmobile, particularly an out-of-control boatmobile. It just keeps the episode moving and makes it very active packed. And story-wise, it's cool that they set up Mrs. Puff's ankle bracelet earlier in the episode, and that paid off at the end. And I think it was a clever way to send her to jail and null and void SpongeBob's test. So yeah, the story is good, it's action-packed, it looks really nice, it's a little bit light on humor, but there are jokes there, and even though there are two parts that I would have trimmed down, overall, this is a good episode. Finally, right? Oh, and one interesting note is that, remember way back in No Free Rides when inside of Mrs. Puff's house there's a picture of her being surprised at the door right as she walks in the door being surprised? It's basically a picture on the wall of the same scene that's happening live. By the way, in that video I mistakenly call it the Squarepants family's house when it's actually Mrs. Puff's. Well, they brought that gag back for some inexplicable reason. And inside Mrs. Puff's house, yet again, is a picture of her sitting on the couch while she is sitting on the couch. It has to be one of the strangest and most surreal gags in Spongebob history, and they decided to bring it back. That's actually pretty cool. 183A. Eek! An urchin! The Krusty Crew and Plankton must team up to catch an urchin and the Krusty Krab. I'm really amazed that it took nine seasons for them to do a story about some sort of pest problem in the kitchen. Sure, the Krusty Krab has had fungus before, but this is just a story idea that seems kind of obvious. And I don't mean to say that it's bad, it's just a good fit for a show about a guy who works at a fast food joint. One of the things I really like about this episode is the camaraderie between four characters who are kind of enemies with each other. Plankton working with crabs, Squidward working with Spongebob. It's not stuff you see super often, so it's cool to see all four of them coming together to defeat a common foe. And there's never any backstabbing by Plankton, though Krabs kinda does leave him for dead. Another thing I really like is the urchin itself. I love how it's animated, I love its big cartoony tongue, I love its purple outline, I love how fast it moves. Though there has been urchins on the show before, particularly in Nature Pants and in a lot of the backgrounds on rocks, we've never really seen this much of any given urchin and I like the redesign here instead of going with just a black dot with some lines sticking out of it. And I like the comedy in the episode, especially involving the urchin. I like it bouncing off of Mr. Krabs' tongue, bouncing all around SpongeBob, almost getting eaten by several Krusty Krab customers. It's weird crush on Plankton. It's all pretty funny. It's a good episode. There's a lot to like here, and I think it's been the funniest episode of season 9 yet. The only thing I don't like about it is the ending, and that's because it's just one of those really obvious endings 
things, and it goes on for a bit too long. Yes, SpongeBob went all the way around the world and ended up back at the Krusty Krab where he releases the urchins again. Duh. This gag has been done before on the show. But that's just the ending, and that's the only bad thing I can say about the episode. Also of note is that this is the first episode that had the HD SpongeBob opening. It didn't have it on first airing, but a rerun of this episode was the very first one to have it. Though I will be talking about this more in Season 9B, because technically it didn't premiere until we were already into Season 9B. Episode 183B, Squid Defense. Sandy and SpongeBob teach Squidward karate for self-defense. So the very first thing I have to point out is that this episode is very similar to Karate Star. A new character learns karate, then uses it to do bad things. And while the details of the story might be different, the same basic concept is there. Even the title card is similar. It makes me wonder if there's going to be an episode in the future where Plankton learned karate off screen and Krabs needs to learn it from Sandy and Spongebob so that he's able to fight Plankton in some sort of big competition. Call it the Karate Crab or something. I don't really have a huge problem with them reusing the X character learns karate episode, but though it's not that big a negative, it's not a positive either. And besides being similar, the story itself is very predictable. I was really hoping that the tough guy was going to turn out to be an actual tough guy, but no, of course, it was just a wacky misunderstanding. And the episode does the whole karate kid thing of you gotta master these mundane tasks to be good at karate. But it really doesn't put too much of a fun SpongeBobby twist on it. It's just Squidward doing chores. And the episode isn't even funny. The only thing I kinda sorta laughed at was Tangled Squidward, where he gets all his tentacles stuck to him, and SpongeBob saying he should have named Gary Scary, if only because of how lame a joke that was. I really didn't think this at first, but after dissecting each part of the episode, I have to say, Scumbob episode. A light one, to be sure, but there's so little comedy, the story is predictable, and there's no fun twists on it at all. It's just an episode that really adds nothing. I would much prefer to watch Karate Star. I should point out that this is finally a Sandy and Squidward episode, but that's somewhat ruined by the fact that A, Spongebob is there the whole time, and B, they don't really play with that at all. Not like in Perfect Chemistry, where they kind of have fun with the pairing of Plankton and Sandy, here they just kind of treat it like it's a normal thing that Squidward and Sandy hang out. It's definitely not the buddy cop movie that I had imagined, though there is crime fighting in it. Without that stupid twist ending, this would be at least a meh, but because it's there, it deflates a lot of the tension and intrigue that was happening in the beginning of the episode. Once you know that he's never in any danger, or you just assume it like I do because it's super predictable, the episode just becomes tedious, like it's building up to a non-event. I wanted to like this episode. It's got Squidward and Sandy in it together, there's a decent justification for why Squidward wants to learn karate, and I'm usually a sucker for these karate episodes anyway. But it's just so bland. It's not one of those super awful episodes with really obvious bad things in it, but there's really very, very little here that I actually enjoyed. 184A, Jailbreak. Plankton and his fellow inmates utilize the power of chum to break out of prison. Fun fact, Plankton's prison number is 655321, and that would be your useless information of the day. It's very rare that we get to actually see Plankton in jail. That hasn't happened too many times on the show, and the only one I can remember off the very top of my head is the beginning of Krabby Road. But it makes sense. Plankton is a criminal, and presumably Krabs occasionally calls the cops on him. And it's refreshing to see a different location. Sure, we've seen prisons on this show a few times before, with doing time being the most obvious. But definitely not very frequently, and it's nice to have another episode set there. It's also pretty cool that all the criminals idolize Plankton. I did not see that coming. I expected everyone to hate Plankton. It's a nice subversion, and it really does help us see that despite his numerous failures, Plankton does have street cred in the seedy underground. And and the reason is pretty funny as well. The fact that everyone just inexplicably uses chum to commit all their crimes because it's such an awful, awful substance. So yeah, I like the story, and it's a decently funny episode as well. The guards all filling in the wall and then finding out they're stuck like that, as well as a lot of Plankton's lines like, are we at the airport? When there's a fist heading his way with an airplane sound effect playing. That's not a super funny episode, but it's funny enough. It's a good episode. It's a very different feeling Plankton episode, and it's a lot of fun, with a lot of really creative elements. Oh, and it's also really cool to see all of the designs of the criminals. I like that they went with an assortment of creatures instead of just making them all generic fish. Oh, and while I'm on the subject, apparently Plankton got over his fear of whales, but I really don't think anyone would mind that an episode contradicts the events of One Course Meal. Episode 184B, Evil Spatula. Plankton uses a mechanical spatula to trick SpongeBob into revealing the formula. So, we've already had an episode where SpongeBob loses his spatula and has to get a new one that turns out to be a jerk. Though there are superficial comparisons between this 
ice and all that glitters, they're really not that similar, and they go in very different directions. However, the direction this goes in is just not very good. Plankton's plan is complicated, sure, but it's not like it's really clever or that interesting. Plankton disguises himself as something to earn Spongebob's trust and trick the formula out of him. They've done that. A lot. And the way Plankton is foiled is just really anticlimactic. Plankton has this crazy elaborate plan, and all that it needs to be ruined is Spongebob mentioning that the spatula belonged to Plankton. Plankton doesn't do anything crazy to reveal himself. Spongebob doesn't figure it out. No. All it takes is Krabs hearing that the spatula was from Plankton. Which... I mean, yeah, you'd be very suspicious if it was from Plankton, but that's a really lame way for his plan to be foiled. Though Mr. Krabs tricking Plankton into using an explosive material to brew the formula, and the subsequent explosion, was actually a pretty good way to end the episode. And I especially like the moment that Plankton realizes that the jig is up. They have a nice little beat before the explosion where you can just see on Plankton's face that he knows he's in trouble. As far as other things I liked, there's really not too many. I do like the setup at the beginning with Mr. Krabs and Spongebob washing the dirty money, because it's just a very interesting and unique lead-up to the episode that makes sense for Mr. Krabs. And there's also a moment of the Krusty Krab customers being ravenous, which was pretty good. Otherwise, everything else about it is standard. Not necessarily bad, just standard. This isn't a great story, and there's not really too many comedic moments, but I also wouldn't necessarily call it bad. It's just meh. To be honest, I wasn't that far off from calling this a scumbob. It is similar to a lot of other Plankton episodes, but there were just enough little amusing things in there for me to bump this up to the meh. And I really don't have much to say beyond that, other than the fact that I found it really gross that Spongebob has no problem using his spatula to clean Gary's litter box. Sure, he's done some unhygienic things on the show before with food, but that one just strikes me as really gross. And not too much later, he uses it as a toothbrush as well. Ugh. Episode 185. It came from Goo Lagoon! Plankton hijacks a mysterious goo blob to use as a weapon. After how great season 8 did with its multiple science fiction inspired episodes, it was nice to see that season 9 brought it back in special form. Although if you think about it, It's a Spongebob Christmas is actually a pretty science fiction-y plot as well. With a mysterious substance that everyone thinks is super harmless and ignores the scientist's expert opinion until that blob turns evil. Well, I guess it doesn't really turn evil so much as Plankton is and he started piloting the thing. Anyway, this is a really fun episode. I like what they do with messing around with the goo in the beginning. Spongebob and Patrick bouncing around on it, Squidward using it as hair, just all sorts of little wacky things they do with it. It's a really nice way to start off the episode. There's also a nice build up to the mystery of what these goo blobs are and exactly what they can do. When Sandy starts going on about how they're dangerous and they could potentially destroy all of Bikini Bottom, which ultimately turns out to be a very big exaggeration. The worst the goo blob does is just make a big mess everywhere. But still, it provides a lot of tension and excitement in the episode, which leads into a fun chase and Sandy and SpongeBob coming up with ways to try to save Bikini Bottom from this goo blob. It's really got all the pieces, action, fun, excitement, tension. I wouldn't say it's quite as good as the Krabby Patty that ate Bikini Bottom or Planet of the Jellyfish, but I do think it is a good episode. It's always cool to see Sandy taking charge and kicking butt. Heck, even Patrick is actually kind of funny in the episode. Sure, he's stupid, but in a more childish and less mean way. On the comedy side of things, it's not a really funny episode, but there is a nice amount of jokes in here, and they're spaced out nicely between the action and the fun of messing around with the goo. Jokes like the goo coming out of the water and into the water. Patrick calling his new friend Spongeblob. Sandy and Spongebob stealing Squidward's bicycle only to take it like three feet to her tree dome. Also, I'm amazed that this episode didn't end with Spongebob absorbing the big goo blob. But in this case, it was solved with bubbles. So I guess I'll amend my statement and say that everything is solved with absorption and bubbles. The biggest failing though, I think, is the ending. The fact that the goo bubble pops and it turns out that it just covers everything in goo. After all the buildup I was expecting, I don't know, maybe a little bit more. I know it's Spongebob, and I know that covering everything in goo is a big threat to Bikini Bottom, but still, after all the effort spent trying to make sure this thing doesn't pop, having it just pop and then not be that big a deal, yeah, it's a bit of a letdown. This is another one of those comedy endings, and I get why they decided to do it this way. I don't think it's awful, but I do think it kind of cheapens the episode to show the bubble actually popping and having it not be that big a deal. Episode 186A, Safe Deposit Crabs. 
Mr. Krabs gets trapped in a bank vault. This episode feels like a whole lot of wasted potential. Mr. Krabs being trapped in a bank vault and SpongeBob and Patrick having to break in to rescue him both sound like good ideas, but they don't really do much with either of them. And I guess it's because the episode's attention is split between too many things. They have to set up what the bank is in a commercial, and then there's a bit of Mr. Krabs trying to get into the bank and getting kicked out repeatedly. So by the time he finally gets trapped in the bank vault and then SpongeBob finds out about it, there isn't really much time for either of the two stories to play out. SpongeBob and Patrick breaking in amounts to basically two different methods, trying to go in through the roof, which leads to them being ejected from another building, and them trying to break in through the front door when the manager opens it up. And that's it. It's not like there's a bunch of plans, it's not like either of these plans are really that interesting or fun or funny, there's just not much to it. And then as far as Mr. Krebs being trapped in the bank vault, he makes a woman out of money and starts dating her, okay, and and then, all of a sudden, it transitions to him thinking that he's trapped on some sort of deserted island with her, and there's a giant money-eating monster, and the island's on fire, and he starts going insane. This is because, according to the episode, Mr. Krabs is running out of oxygen which is a little weird considering, you know, underwater, but okay, fine. They didn't want to say water because that might be confusing. But I don't get why they had to go with this deserted island thing. Was there so little ideas for what to do with Mr. Krabs in the bank vault that suddenly have to transport him to another deserted location? Why not have him get lost inside a jungle full of money? Or maybe he loses that one penny that he cared so much for at the beginning of the episode amongst all the piles of money and has to go searching for it, maybe learning some sort of lesson about sentimental value over financial value or something. I don't know. There's a lot of ideas that they could have done with this, but they really just don't do that much. And the ending is disappointing. The solution is that the bank manager just lets SpongeBob in and frees Mr. Krabs. SpongeBob's attempts to break in mean absolutely nothing, and Krabs doesn't really do anything to try to escape his situation. So from a story perspective, not a lot actually happens. As far as things I liked about the episode, I liked that Pearl tells Spongebob to just call Mr. Krabs because it's such a simple, mundane solution and it makes a lot of sense. It's especially great with Pearl's reaction and acting like this was incredibly obvious. Also, uh, Mr. Krabs' butt sticking out of the safe deposit box was kinda funny, I guess? That's really all I've got. It's not an abysmal episode, but it just is so lacking in every way. It's not funny, the story seems to be too split up, and it just doesn't run with its premise. I'm gonna say it's a Scumbob episode. This was another one that I think was pretty close to meh, because I don't strongly hate it, and it's not like there's any elements that are really bad or really annoying or really frustrating, it's just an episode that does not come together in any way. If they had focused on Spongebob and Patrick breaking in, then yeah, they probably could have told a better story. Or if they had just focused on Mr. Krabs inside the vault, then you probably could have done a lot with that too. But the episode just doesn't have that much focus. And really, above all else, it's just boring. Weak story, weak comedy, and I found myself just not really caring. Oh, and, uh... Fun fact, this is Pearl's first appearance in Season 9. But it's definitely not her most major appearance. 186B, Plankton's Pet. Plankton adopts a pet amoeba. Out of all the characters that had personality changes after the first Spongebob movie, Plankton has definitely been affected the absolute least. He's stayed pretty in character and fun the whole time. However, the one downside of Plankton is that almost all of his stories revolve around him wanting to steal the formula. And though there's been many clever twists on that over the years, and of course I don't want them to stop doing those episodes altogether, it is always nice when they do something a little bit different with the character. Like the time he traded places with Krabs just to see what it would be like, or whenever he has to team up with Krabs. It's always really refreshing and fun to see something like this, an episode that, yes, does reference stealing the formula, but for the most part is just about Plankton finding a different hobby and doing something else. I mean, heck, the beginning of the episode is basically about how Plankton has nothing else going on in his life and SpongeBob suggesting he gets a hobby. And I think that his character works really well here. Just because he's evil and steals the formula doesn't mean that he can't have a genuine relationship with a pet. And Plankton works as very sympathetic in the episode without feeling like he's out of character. At its heart, it is just a basic boy and his dog story. Plankton learning the ins and outs of caring for a pet, the pet runs away, Plankton desperately tries to find the pet, and then winds up in danger himself, and the pet saves the day. It is very simple on paper, but the episode works so well, thanks to Plankton being a fun protagonist and how sincere and sweet he is in the episode, as well as how likable this little amoeba spot is. They 
made him really cute and I like all the little bits they have with him being tiny and getting squished and being able to multiply his cells to get bigger. Sure they could have just gone with a worm or something, but this works out so much better because it is original to the show. But it's not just about how likable the characters are here, it's also about how funny the episode is. A lot of the stuff at the beginning with everyone thinking Mr. Krabs is torturing a baby when it's really Plankton in a mechanical suit, that's actually really dang funny. As well as Plankton accidentally crushing Spot and thinking he killed him. These are morbid jokes for sure, but they're funny. It's a basic story that just works really well thanks to how likable and enjoyable the characters are, how it puts a character in a situation we've really never seen before, and just how funny it is. It's a very good episode. And I think it's really great that they sell us on this idea that Plankton really does care for this pet, to the point where even when Spot ruins his chances of getting a Krabby Patty, the most Plankton does is want to punish him for about five minutes. Also, I like that there really isn't much of a twist in the episode. Yes, there's a little one with it turning out that Spot was on Plankton's cornea the whole time, but there's no, like, giant twist where Spot was actually just a mechanical pet designed by Plankton to just steal the Krabby Patty formula, or that this whole thing has been a ruse to try to distract Spongebob or something stupid like that. I'm glad that they did keep the focus of the episode on Plankton getting an actual pet that he is genuinely bonding with and not just using as a means to an end. I would much rather have a genuinely sweet ending and episode overall like this than them trying to do some sort of stupid comedy punchline at the end or making Plankton unlikable for the sake of jokes. Oh, and fun fact, apparently Spongebob mentions losing Gary for eight minutes. I was really hoping it was going to be a reference to Have You Seen the Snail, but instead they decided to go with a gag of how comedically short a time it was that Spongebob lost Gary. 187A, don't look now, Spongebob and Patrick get spooked by a scary movie. So this episode is basically split into two parts. There's the whole setup with Spongebob and Patrick watching the movie, walking home, getting scared, and annoying Squidward, and then there's the second part where Squidward decides to dress up like the villain from the movie and torment Spongebob and Patrick. As far as the first part goes, it's a little dry. I would have liked more comedy and a little less screaming. Though the screaming here isn't that bad and totally justified in story, Story, eh, there could have still been a little bit less of it. And it feels a little bit drawn out with them seeing the movie twice, having Spongebob walk Patrick to his rock, and then Patrick walk Spongebob back to his pineapple. It does just feel a little bit slow and a little bit too much like it's set up. Especially because there's been plenty of other episodes with Spongebob and or Patrick being scared of something. Like when Spongebob was scared of the horror movie in Crabborg. No, what I see as the real draw of this episode is Squidward essentially becoming a slasher villain and scaring the ever-loving tar out of Spongebob and Patrick. On the surface, this sounds a lot like Graveyard Shift, but in that episode, it was just Squidward telling a scary story. In this one, he's become the scary story. And I really like that aspect. I think this is something that makes sense for Squidward. It's understandable that he'd be annoyed by Spongebob and Patrick screaming all over the place, but he obviously takes it way too far, and in my opinion, he gets what he deserves at the end. Especially with the extra irony that Spongebob and Patrick are trying to save Squidward from this villain. There are a few decent gags in the episode, like how over the top the kissing scene was, and the fish hook digging in Patrick's nose, which is actually a surprise because I'm usually not a big fan of nose picking gags, but something about the way this one played out actually worked pretty well. But overall, it's not a very funny episode. I think it rounds out to be about a meh. My favorite part of the episode was when Spongebob and Patrick were trying to rescue Squid from the fisherman. What makes that scene extra fun is that they play the now that were men music from the Spongebob movie, as Spongebob and Patrick decide to become heroic, and it actually works as a really nice motif. I wish they would do this in other episodes and have it play whenever Spongebob and Patrick did something particularly brave. However, the dumb thing about this is that I think they played the music not because of its ties to the Spongebob movie, but because it's kind of a football anthem and Spongebob and Patrick were making a football play at the time. I really hope they went with it for a direct reference, but knowing how this show is, I doubt it, and unfortunately I think this was just a really nice coincidence. It's an okay episode. I think it's worth checking out once to see Squidward's appearance, but there's not really enough here to warrant a rewatch. Episode 187B, Seance Schmeance. Spongebob summons ghosts that refuse to leave the Krusty Krab. It's always ghosts with this show, man. Why can't we get, like, an episode with a mummy or a vampire or a swamp monster or something? Why is it always ghosts? And this one doesn't even have the Flying Dutchman in it. So yeah, that's my first gripe. It's similar to other ghost episodes. It reminds me a little bit of Ghost Host, and they use the music and at least one ghost design from Ghoul Fools. I wouldn't say it's a ripoff of any of the other episodes per se, but it is a little bit similar. 
similar. Additionally, outside of the very opening, I didn't find this episode funny at all. Yes, I did like the really cheesy, weird soap opera about ghosts and toilet paper, but that was about it. I don't know, maybe Spongebob reading from the sacred text of a mustard label was kind of funny as well, but that's being pretty generous. So it's not funny, and it's another ghost episode. Do I have anything good to say about it? Well, I like Mr. Krabs kicking ghost butt at the end. I wish there was a little bit more of that, but that was still pretty cool. And the story itself is decent. I like the setup in that they introduce the concept of a seance and give Spongebob a good reason to do one, all in pretty short time. And in fact, the whole episode is actually paced pretty well. There wasn't really any point that I was bored. Did I like it? No. But I also can't say that I disliked it either. Hmm, if only I had a rating for that. Oh yeah, meh. And in terms of individual aspects of the episode, I find a lot of them to just be middle of the road. The character of Rusty and his weird sandwiches are just eh. I don't find them to be funny or good, but I don't find them to be bad or too boring either. Though those sandwiches are definitely really gross. 188A, Kenny the Cat. SpongeBob idolizes an athlete with a secret. So this episode is weird. It's weird because Spongebob is not known for taking on real life issues. Sure, they might have morals every now and again, but it's usually the generic be kind to others sort of message. It's not the type of show that I would really expect to cover the interesting and complex issue of athletes cheating, because yeah, that's what this is a metaphor for. If the episode had just been about an athlete cheating, then I wouldn't say that it's being particularly topical or referencing real world issues, but because they go into the whole argument of, well, even though I'm cheating, I'm making a lot of people happy and a lot of people look up to me, so it's okay and it's a good thing. It definitely seems like they're trying to specifically reference a real life issue here. But of course, it just takes the side of cheating is wrong and cheating is bad. So although it is kind of topical, it's not like it's really too political or complicated. Anyway, about the quality of the episode itself, of course, I'm going to point out that this is not the first time that SpongeBob has idolized over a character who turned out to be less than a hero. First, there was was Kevin from I'm Your Biggest Fanatic. And weirdly enough, Patrick also calls Spongebob out for his creepy obsession in this episode, as well as that one. It's another one of those cases where it's not a huge deal that this episode is similar because it is taken in a different way. Whereas Kevin was a horrible jerk to Spongebob, Kenny the Cat is just a dirty cheater. But though it may not be a ripoff, the episode is just meh. For reasons I'm about to explain. First of all, the episode is very poorly paced. There is a lot of buildup, and it does make sense to have it be like that to an extent, because you do want to build up how much SpongeBob likes Kenny, but at the same time, because they built it up so much, there wasn't really much time for the main conflict of the episode to actually play out. He arrives at the Krusty Krab, SpongeBob almost immediately finds him cheating, they have a discussion over whether or not SpongeBob is going to tell, Sandy busts him anyway, and then bam, the episode is over. Kenny being revealed as a big cheater really didn't actually amount to much. A bunch of people just walked away disappointedly. There really should have been maybe a little bit more to it than that. And if the setup wasn't so long, then they could have definitely put something else there. Nextly, there's the issue of comedy, and that the episode isn't very funny. Yeah, okay, there's maybe one or two jokes I like, like SpongeBob breathing a bunch of water into Squidward, or Mr. Krabs thinking that Kenny's been inside his wallet, but most of those jokes are at the beginning, and the episode kind of stops being funny after that. Which leads me to my next issue. It's a little bit melodramatic when Spongebob discovers Kenny's big secret and then has a passionate discussion over whether he should reveal it or not. The show takes it just a little bit too seriously for my liking. The episode needed to be more comedic in general, but those particular scenes should have been a little bit more comedic to lighten the tone. And this is part of the reason why I feel like this episode was trying to be like a ripped from the headlines type story. But because it's Spongebob, which doesn't have any layer of complexity, it doesn't really do that good a job at that. I don't mind there being a more serious conflict conflict, but please at least throw a few jokes in there to lighten the mood. But after saying all of that, I find myself in the same position I was when talking about seance schmance, in that although it doesn't really do many things right, I can't really say it does much wrong either. Sure, it might not be paced out in the greatest way, but it did hold my attention through and through. And it was interesting to see an animated cat on the show for the first time. Plus, Bismarcky does a pretty good job voicing him, and I do like that very first scene, which like I said, had some decent jokes in there, and that's why I believe it to be a meh. It has a few problems, and does a few things right. And I do especially like Patrick being creeped out at Spongebob's obsession, because he voiced exactly what I was thinking. Episode 188B, Yeti Crabs. 
a snow monster terrorizes the Krusty Krab. Before I get into the episode, I want to point out that this episode aired exactly one year after Kenny the Cat, and those are the last two episodes of season 9A. It took them a whole year to air two episodes. Like I said at the beginning, I understand why Nickelodeon held this one because they probably weren't entirely sure when the new episodes made after the second Spongebob movie would actually be finished. So holding this one to make sure they had it just in case the ratings for Nickelodeon dipped really low low and they needed to air it was probably a smart idea. Anyway, as far as the actual episode goes, it basically boils down to one thing that happens again and again and again and again. SpongeBob doing chores around the Krusty Krab. At first he does them just because he's a good employee, and then he does them because he's afraid that the Yeti Krab will eat him if he doesn't. But that is seriously what the bulk of this episode is, and I didn't find these chores to be funny, but all of them were done in at least mildly amusing ways. Even if it was a bit repetitive and a lot of these tasks I've seen SpongeBob do in other episodes. And if Don't Look Now was kind of similar to Graveyard Shift, then the plot of this episode is actually very very similar to Graveyard Shift, where it features a character at the Krusty Krab telling another character a story in order to scare them, and then that thing that they were telling the story about just so happens to show up, which causes a big misunderstanding. Ironically though, this episode has the opposite misunderstanding happen, where it's a real monster that Squidward doesn't believe is real. Again, it's not too similar, but it doesn't really get any points for originality there. As far as the Yeti Krab itself, it's pretty cool. I like the design, I like its mannerisms. I wouldn't say anything about it is really great or really interesting, but there's nothing wrong with it. That's right, it's another meh episode. It's not funny, and the story isn't great, but at the same time it doesn't really have any problems outside of that, and I was at least mildly amused by what happened. It just could have been a little bit more interesting and a little bit less repetitive. My favorite part has to be the fact that Squidward actually did decide to try to stand up for Spongebob, saying that even though he's an idiot, he still doesn't deserve to be treated poorly, which is kind of ironic considering Squidward dressed up as a horror movie character to scare Spongebob only a few episodes ago. All in all, middle of the road stuff. Episode 189, Spongebob, you're fired. I didn't feel like writing a description because it's pretty much in the title. Oh boy, this is a bad episode. Buckle up guys, because this is gonna be a long review. All right, let's just go chronologically here. First off, let's talk about the reason SpongeBob is fired. It's because Mr. Krabs can save a nickel. Yeah, it's a stupid comedy, hurdy der Mr. Krabs is cheap joke. What's annoying about this is that this is the event that sets in motion this whole episode. This also sets up SpongeBob being pretty bummed out for the rest of the first half of the episode. It's a big deal and the show treats it like a stupid joke. I don't mind Mr. Krabs joking about him being fired with a pink slip and all that stuff, but I am bothered by the reasoning because that is a plot point. It makes me not want to take this story seriously because of just how stupid it is to fire SpongeBob over such a small amount of money when it's obvious that in the long run he should be making a lot more money by employing SpongeBob than by not employing him. Like, imagine if in the SpongeBob movie, instead of Mr. Krabs not allowing Sp SpongeBob to run the Krusty Krab tube because he was too immature, but instead because it would save me a hay penny. Arr, 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 arr. That would be stupid. The reason why they didn't do that was because that was an important point that set up the whole movie. Mr. Krabs' decision there had a lot of weight to it. Not only does it set up the plot, but it sets up the core theme of the movie of SpongeBob feeling like he's looked down upon for being childlike. But here, it's just a dumb joke. Even in Can You Spare a Dime, when Squidward was fired over a dime, at least in that instance, it was not just because of the dime, but because Mr. Krabs thought he was stealing and because they had a big argument about it. It was more than just literally a dime. And that episode was only 11 minutes long, not nearly as melodramatic as this. And that one was, oh, I don't know, funny? Honestly, I think if Spongebob was going to be fired, Model Sponge did it a lot better than this in how it was a wacky misunderstanding. Sure, that episode is far from perfect, but it's better than this one, and I'd much rather have it be a misunderstanding than him being fired for an incredibly stupid reason. Alright, so after that, we get Depressed Bob Bummer Pants. Unlike Are You Happy Now, at least Spongebob's depression here isn't trying to make light of the actual mental illness, and is instead more depression in the way of something really bad happened to him 
them and he feels sad about it. But just because it's not offensive doesn't mean it's not awful. While it makes sense for SpongeBob to be miserable about what happened to him, none of it is funny in the slightest and it goes on for several minutes. He doesn't snap out of it until halfway through the episode. Again, comparing it back to Model Sponge, at least in that episode they made SpongeBob get over it relatively quickly because it's just a bummer to watch SpongeBob be this miserable for this long. Comparing it back to the SpongeBob movie, at least there they made SpongeBob be bummed out in a weird, funny, and unusual way, having him get kind of drunk and instead of just being miserable, being really belligerent and grumpy. Here, he's just so low energy and just so depressed. Not only is it not fun to see SpongeBob be like this for this long, but it also makes the episode's pacing become really slow. Because everything SpongeBob does, he does it in a slow, drawn out way. Realistically, if this was your dream job and you lost it, you would probably be in the same boat. But remember, this is here to entertain us, and SpongeBob is not a drama. You have to be very careful in making your protagonist be this unfunnily bummed out, and make sure it doesn't go on for too long or isn't obnoxious noxious like it is here. So Spongebob being miserable really ruins any potential that the whole fun employment bit could have actually had. And wow, great Sandy, you're doing things that are incredibly unethical, that's just wonderful. In the second half of the episode, Spongebob decides that he needs to get a new job. So of course he goes to all the food places, but uh oh, all Spongebob can make is Krabby Patties. Because that's never been done before, and the worst part about this is that it's not a montage, it's not a bunch of quick cuts, it's a long drawn out thing of Spongebob going to restaurant after restaurant after restaurant where the same thing happens every time. It's as monotonous as Atlantis Square Panis. Having a character do something four times with the same result every time is not an interesting story. You have to vary it up a bit or put it in a montage or something. So after all that, Spongebob goes home and goes to feed Gary, but he doesn't have any snail po, so he makes his own, which turns out to be like a Krabby Patty because that's all he can make. Oh, wait, no, that would make sense. Instead, he makes really good tasting snail food, which leads to nothing at all. This whole scene of SpongeBob making snail food has nothing to do with anything that happens in the episode. You think maybe it's gonna set up that, oh wow, SpongeBob can actually make snail food, so maybe he'll go to work at a snail food place? But no, no, that's not what happens. So the show just contradicts itself in saying that he can make something other than Krabby Patties for exactly no reason. And then after this, SpongeBob gets kidnapped by the hot dog guy. The one who thought that Spongebob turning his hot dogs into patties was an abomination? Yeah, apparently he served them to his customers and they loved it. This directly contradicts what actually happens earlier in the episode where he throws the patties on the ground and kicks Spongebob out. But hey, who needs consistency? Who needs logical sense? It's just a wacky Spongebob cartoon. No, it's not for the sake of a joke. Spongebob doesn't point this out. It's just an inconsistency because they didn't care. And instead of just hiring Spongebob, this guy decided to kidnap him because there's no reasoning. There's none. There's none whatsoever. I don't know. He didn't want to pay Spongebob. Maybe it was all a ruse. I have no idea. Because this twist is stupid. And then the pizza guy rescues him. But uh oh, the pizza guy wants to kidnap him too. And so does the Chinese food guy and the taco guy. Which leads to all these fast food mascot guys fighting it out over Spongebob. Which incidentally is my favorite part of the episode, but only out of context. In context, it's incredibly out of left field and so far away from what was supposed to be the initial premise of this episode. The scene itself is alright, but its placement in the episode is just baffling. Then Spongebob is rescued by a Krabby Patty mascot who turns out to be Squidward and surprise of all surprises, the Krusty Krab was horribly run without Spongebob. Because that has never happened on the show and wasn't the most obvious way to bring him back to the Krusty Krab. Look, I get it. It's obvious to everyone that he's gonna end up back at the Krusty Krab at the end of the episode, but that's no reason to just completely phone in the excuse to get him back. Come on, do something different. Give us something better than this. It's a Scumbob episode. And you probably saw that coming, right? But didn't I make the ride to get there enjoyable and interesting, even though where I was going to end up was pretty obvious? Hmm, if only this episode did that. But no, this is just a Abysmal. The episode has no focus with random scenes that have nothing to do with anything. A completely awful reason for the story to even happen in the first place is stupidly melodramatic and slow, and almost everything that happens in it 
feels so been there, done that. Even the name of the episode is very similar to Mrs. Puff, You're Fired. Was there any good jokes in here? I have no idea because I was too distracted by how awful this story is. And the ending to the episode was the most bland and predictable thing to ever happen in Spongebob. And by the way, had exactly nothing to do with the events of the episode. You could show the beginning of the episode, do a time card that says, one day later, and then show the ending of the episode, and you would lose exactly zero information. Great story, right? Where everything the protagonist does has exactly nothing to do with the main conflict. I'd be willing to bet that this episode came about because Nickelodeon wanted something that was going to guarantee them high ratings. The fact that it has a super attention-grabbing title like Spongebob You're Fired, combined with how awful the episode is, really makes me feel like this was an executive's idea and that the people working on this episode did not want to be working on this episode. And it really stands out given the fact that there is nothing else this season that is anywhere near as bad as this episode. And I am so glad this is the last episode I'm reviewing in the video because I feel like I need to take a break from the show after watching this three times. It really is that bad and one of the worst of the series. And that is every episode of Spongebob Season 9 A reviewed. I'm not even going to bother wasting the time to build this up. This half season is meh. It's meh in the same way that season four is meh, in that there's a lot of meh episodes, most of the good episodes aren't actually that good, and most of the bad episodes aren't actually that bad. I'm only going to compare it chart-wise to the other meh seasons, because that's what's really interesting. And you're going to want to ignore the numbers on this and just look at the charts, because those are of course full seasons, and this is only a little under half of one. And percentage-wise, this has more meh than any of the others. This isn't very surprising though, the longer a show goes on, the more difficult it is to not repeat yourself and to come up with some fresh ideas. There are a lot of episodes this season, almost all of them in fact, that remind me of another episode or a few other episodes that the show has done before. This isn't always an awful thing, but it's a surefire sign that your show has gone on too long. And it's not purely the fact that they're similar to other episodes that's problematic, it's the fact that they don't bring new things to the table as well. Is 9A better than season 8? No. Honestly, I think they're about the same. There is absolutely overall less frustrating elements in 9A and 8, but the problem is that the humor still just isn't really there, and most of the stories are just too weak to stand on their own without the comedy. And while I give the show credit for at least staying consistent and not having 9A be worse than 8, personally, I don't think season 9 is the big second coming of good Spongebob. Well, the first 20 episodes anyway. The statistics aren't bad enough that this season is doomed to be meh or scum. Bob, but 9B would have to be pretty glowing for it to make it out of the meh territory. But hey, it's possible. You'll just have to tune into every episode of SpongeBob Season 9B Reviewed to find out. As far as notes, I've already covered a lot of what I wanted to say at the very beginning of the video and in other parts here at the end. So I only have two notes left. Thus far in season 9, there's been a lot of little continuity nods to older episodes. The TV show Patrick was watching in Squid Baby, the picture gag in Mrs. Puff's house, the My Leg gag being referenced, among others. It's nice that they were able to throw in these little easter eggs that only longtime fans would really pick up on. And after Bubble Buddy returns, I'm kind of glad they went to really small, subtle references instead of being big and obvious with it. As far as my other note, look at all these good episodes and tell me if you noticed something that 4 out of 5 of them have in common. Yes. They almost all heavily feature Plankton, and of these, none of them are traditional Steal the Formula episodes. Eakin Urchin involves him helping crabs, Jailbreak is a lot more focused on the Jailbreak itself, It Came From Goo Lagoon has Plankton utilizing a weapon more so than outright trying to steal the formula or trick it out of the characters, and Plankton's pet has almost nothing to do with the formula. It makes me so happy to see that the writers definitely want to mix things up with Plankton and don't want to just rehash the same story idea ideas again and again. Sure, we did have cliche evil spatula, but 4 out of 5 of his major appearances shaking up the formula, no pun intended, is a very good thing. Because there's only 5 good and 6 scumbob episodes, I'm not gonna do a top 5 and bottom 5. That'll be saved for the 9B review, and I'll have top and bottom lists for all of season 9 at once. But I will tell you my favorite and least favorite episodes of season 9 thus far. I think the best has to be Plankton's Pet. It's the funniest episode, it puts the character in a place we haven't seen him before and 
and does something different. All while actually managing to be genuinely sweet, which is not something that Spongebob is a lot of the time. It takes one of the best characters on the show and puts him in a classic story, with plenty of Spongebob elements to go along with it, like the fact that the dog is actually an amoeba. And my least favorite episode, no contest, Spongebob, you're fired. I've seen plenty of lousy specials on this show, but man, is this up there with one of the worst. There are some basic storytelling mistakes here, like directly contradicting themselves without making a joke about it, and having scenes that have nothing to do with anything. On top of all that, the first half of the episode is about as far away from fun as you could imagine. All of the drama attempts are completely nullified by how stupid the reasoning is for this to be happening, and any comedy is overshadowed by how much of a bummer the first half is, and how random and illogical the story in the second half is. Big thanks to the usual folks, as well as my Patreon people. Don't worry, there'll be an extended credits in 9B. And with that, Pie Guy Rules, out.